in the books. Nerlens Noel is in Dallas. Jaleel Okafor is in Philly. Boogie Cousins is in New Orleans. And that's really a lot of the big movement there. We had a lot of other deals. We'll get into this very interesting conversation we're about to have. I'm really excited to hear. If you read over at HoopsHype.com, Alex Kennedy, the NBA writer over there, writes the article about how NBA trades go down. This is how leaks get out and how front offices come together and how a deal is really put together, which should be really interesting knowing what happened here in Philadelphia over the last couple of days. Brian Colangelo spoke today. We'll get into that. Ben Simmons in, uh, announced that he is out for the year. Uh, we will get into all of that and more with Alex Kennedy from Hoops Hype here on the Sports Bash 97.3 ESPN. Welcome back, Alex. What's happening, pal? Hey, not much. How are you? Good, man. Uh, I want to first focus in on your story, which was really a great uh, insight into an NBA deal and how it gets down and how the leaks get out there. And I guess you start with the leaks because we hear so much about trades and, oh, these two teams are talking. And we saw what happened here with Jaleel Okafor. Uh, how uh, did you find out, you know, what are some of the ways, you know, that, that the rumors and the stuff starts to get out there? Yeah, uh, it was pretty interesting. You know, that was one of the things that I wasn't anticipating adding to that article. But then the more executives I talked to, the more gyms I talked to, they all kind of brought it up and mentioned how uh, you can learn a lot by the leaks. So uh, really what the general manager said was if you see a leak, you know, immediately look at who is benefiting from the information being out there. And that's a really good way to kind of tell who is uh, putting the information out. And then there are some times where, you know, teams will trade information with the media or, you know, a younger front office person or a newer front office person will put some information out there, try to get the media on their side uh, because they think it will help them down the road. Um, you know, there's, there's things like that that occurs too. But um, it just seems like a lot of times teams put out information to help their own uh, leverage in trade talks or to upset another player on another team and try to land them. So if you're the, you know, Boston Celtics, for example, you're putting it out there that, you know, you're talking uh, uh, trades uh, to get Jimmy Butler, to get Paul George, to get Carmel Anthony, you know, name the team, name the player. That not only helps, you know, the market for your Brooklyn Nets pick, but it also potentially upsets that player. And, you know, we've already seen that. Paul George has come out and says that, he, and says that uh, you know, he's upset and he didn't like being included in trade rumors. Jimmy Butler was upset over the offseason. You know, that makes these players that usually wouldn't be available potentially available because now you're talking about them being unhappy with the trade rumors as well. So uh, you I know, thought that was probably the most interesting part. Yeah, and when you talk about leaks, you know, without obviously, you know, revealing your own sources or things like that, we hear sources a lot. Are these uh, the guy who rides the elevator? I mean, says, hey, uh, the, the GM was it? I mean, is it a, 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 an usher? I mean, sometimes we hear these sources all the time. Are they typically coming from inside of the organization? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I can't speak for everyone's sources, but I know that, you know, at Hoopsite, for example, I won't run something unless I have it from two sources. So, uh, for example, last week, uh, I heard the Utah Jazz were shopping Derek Favors, but I had that from one GM, and I know the Utah Jazz shoot things down immediately. So I wanted it from two GMs potentially before running that, or, you know, if the Jazz would confirm, but they never would confirm that. So really, I was trying to get two sources on the record. I couldn't get it, so uh, I didn't write it, and then Zach Lowe ultimately reported it. So uh, I confirmed it at that point because it was already out there, but I never want to put something down unless I have it from multiple teams. Um, you know, I think that with Twitter now and with so many people trying to report on things that you do get a lot more rumors out there, um, you know, and some people may have different sources. You know, I don't know if people are talking to, you know, like you said, you know, a guy in the elevator or, or you know, a guy close to an executive but I, I'm always hesitant to believe people like that. Um, I think it's better to talk to, you know, players, agents, executives, coaches, you know, people that are really involved in the decision making and, and uh, you know, when it comes to trade lo deadline or free agency or, you know, you name the you know, time of year. But I, I think that that's typically the case with a lot of the people who break news at a high level. Um, but, you know, it could be how some of these smaller rumors got out there, too. I'm not sure. Alex, you, you touched a little bit on uh, what I wanted to ask you about, which is social media. Uh, has social media made uh, trades uh, and the job of the GMs easier, harder? Is social media a good thing? Because we do all crave that information fast, and sometimes 
uh, that information that's out on social media isn't always right. Yeah, you know, every executive I talked to said it made their job harder. Um, you know, I'd asked a few of them, you know, can it help you a little bit because there's more information and you know, you know, of everything that's happening. But a lot of them said no, that, you know, they have other ways of gathering information. And really all that social media does is make their jobs harder because now they basically told me that, you know, years ago, 10 years ago, for example, um, you had, they had way less questions about trades from people within the organization. Now you have a ton of players and agents and coaches reading about trade rumors online because it's, you know, there as soon as they pick their phone up or their tablet up. Um, so people in the organization now are constantly coming to the GM and saying, hey, what's going on? I heard this. Is that true? Or, um, you know, media are constantly calling general managers and executives and asking about trades. Uh, Mike Zarin, the assistant GM of the Celtics, touched on that actually on Twitter. Um, Isaiah Thomas like had tweeted out about that the uh, eyes emoji, <laughs> and everyone went nuts. Uh, it, this was last week, last Monday, and everyone went nuts and thought the Celtics had made a trade because the last time he had did that was when Al Horford got traded, or uh, I'm sorry, when he signed with the Celtics uh, in free agency. So uh, every so Mike Zarin tweeted that 20 media members called him immediately after because he's the assistant GM of the Celtics, asking what trade happened. So that stuff happens more than you know. So I think most of them view social media as an annoyance. Uh, and, uh, you know, it also potentially upsets players, too, because now you're having to, you know, deal with more of these rumors and, and you know, talk to the players about what's going on. Alex Kennedy, hoopshype.com. Uh, this is a great piece uh, that we're kind of looking at here uh, about how trades go down. And uh, as you write, there's a lot of people that work on these trades. A lot of people, I guess, just envision Brian Colangelo sitting in an office uh, locked in there all by himself. But that might not necessarily be the way uh, that the Sixers and the Mavericks got that deal done. Yeah, and I mean, that's what I'm, that's when you write the article in the first place, because there's so many misconceptions about how a trade happens in the NBA. And the staff is just so big. So, you know, you have people that are cap experts and analytics experts and scouts and consultants and assistant GM and, uh, you know, all these different people that are involved in the process. You know, ownership could be involved depending on the organization or the uh, scope of the deal. So uh, there are a ton of different people that have a role. And the GM is obviously the figurehead, and, you know, they make a lot of the big decisions uh, along with, you know, ownership. If there's a big deal happening, they, they will usually sign off on it. But there's a ton of people that are constantly pitching things and talking to people and information gathering. Um, so I think a lot of deals start off with, you know, either conversations that have been ongoing throughout the year, and you get a kind of good, you get an idea of what teams are interested in, in certain players of yours. But a lot of those conversations aren't happening at the GM level. Sometimes it's the assistant GM. Sometimes it's scouts running into each other, you know, on the road. Um, sometimes it's the cap guy that's constantly looking at different teams and their situations and saying, okay, you know, this team has an expiring player. This team needs to hit the salary cap floor. Or this team has two expiring because uh, they had two 10-day guys just go recently, and now we can try to call them with this offer. There's a lot of different people that are involved in the process, and I think that's something that um, is the biggest misconception. Uh, you know, you talk about where there's smoke, there's fire, and so many times, as Pete kind of mentioned, social media, we see these tweets, two teams, uh, so-and-so's interested here, and so-and-so's interested here. And then a lot of times – the trade deadline comes, and Nerlens Noel gets sent to Dallas. Well, those two teams were never mentioned and never talked about. Meanwhile, you got Okafor, who's attached to four teams. Pelicans, they sat him, Pacers, right? And, and, and it seems like where there's smoke, there's fire. But I guess it depends on who it's coming from. Yeah, and that's one thing I really wanted to stress. Um, the the top, you know, guys, Adrian Wojnarowski, Zach Lowe, or a few that were mentioned by executives. Those guys are rarely wrong. And I think the one thing you see is they rarely report on rumors, too. Typically, they're reporting on deals that um, are about to happen. Or, I mean, Zach, he's very specific about what he writes. For example, you know, he wrote that Derek Favors, I mentioned, was being, you know, chopped around. And that is true. And I think that, you know, like, like I said, sometimes those conversations are missing context. Uh, sometimes they are, uh, you know, partially right but i think for the most part they're accurate um and i do think that you know a lot of the reports we saw about Jalil okafor were accurate i do think that the sixers were talking to a ton of different teams about okafor and trying to shop him and see what was out there in terms of the trade um you know i think the noel thing really shocked everyone and kind of changed the approach from the sixers but um i do think that you know guys like david aldridge who was reporting throughout this process that you know okafor was almost traded that they were near a deal with the blazers that it fell apart 
that, you know, they were gearing up to trade him again. I think that is, you know, right for the most part, and then the team changed their mind. So I think part of it is also when you report on rumors, the situation is very fluid. You can be right one day, and then the trade deadline comes, and a team changes their mind completely. Or, I mean, look at the case of the Kings, you know, trading DeMarcus Cousins. They were telling everyone, not only media, but other teams, the player himself, uh, and the player's agent a week before, and then we're telling teams, you know, an hour before the trade deadline, or not the trade deadline, an hour before their trade, that they weren't going to move him. And that was because, you know, they had they were trying to help their leverage and they were trying to, you know, get more out of the three or four teams they were talking to. But, you know, sometimes teams just change their mind, too, and these situations are very fluid. I think that's important to keep in mind. So all these people, all these staffers that you talked about, Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and yet Paul George stays put, Jimmy Butler stays put, Carmelo Anthony doesn't move. How do you sum up the trade deadline, Alex? Well, I think it was pretty active. I mean, the trade deadline itself wasn't as active, but if you look at the week as a whole, you know, and basically look at all the moves that happened that week versus, you know, those few hours, I just think that this was a trade deadline that was interesting because the deals were stretched out over, you know, a week versus a few hours. But if you, you know, take things as a whole, you had a superstar and Marcus Cousins get traded. You had a number of very good players like Serge Ibaka and Lou Williams and, you know, guys like that that were moved. Um, and then, you know, I think there were four or five trades in the days leading up to the deadline. So if you count those in, then I think there was more movement. Uh, but unfortunately, like you said, deadline day was pretty boring. Um, but again, I think that, you know, nothing that was reported was wrong. The Pacers were talking to a number of different teams, whether it be the Hawks or the Nuggets or the Lakers or the Celtics, about Paul George. And I think throughout the day, you kind of saw people reporting he could be available, but you know who really knows if the Pacers will trade him. Uh, and here's why they're looking to trade him, because he may want to go to the Lakers. And I think that's all still true, and he could be traded this summer. But I think that you know at, the, at, at that moment, I think fans get excited. And look, I get excited too in the media. I'm sitting there on Twitter watching what Adrian Wojnarowski is tweeting and hoping we see all these different blockbusters. I think we kind of get our hopes up as a group. And then when the teams, you know, ultimately don't move these stars like Jimmy Butler, Paul George, Blake Griffin, Carmelo Anthony, Hmm. we're kind of all let down. But, you know, that's part of now these days being involved and, you know, having reporters report on everything from, you know, the conversations to the rumors to what teams considering internally. And, you know, the more you know, then you're going to have these different rumors and reports out there. Um, and ultimately, you know, there are some letdowns, but I think you're you're more informed about the team's thinking than usual. Uh, Alex Kennedy's with us, HoopsHype.com. Let's look at some of the things that happened here. Noel gets traded to Dallas. Uh, give us your insight on that. Uh, the Sixers apparently, you know, Colangelo said today they weren't going to sign him. He was a restricted free agent. Uh, they just weren't going to come to terms with the money he was looking for. So that being said, did they get enough? Did you like the deal, or would you have rather, say, match it and then try to work a deal out somewhere down the road? Yeah, I mean, I didn't like the return. I felt like they should have gotten uh, a pick with better protections if they're going to you know, move him away. I like Justin Anderson. I think he's going to be a good player. Um, you know, I've liked him since he was in college. I think he could develop into a contributor for them. But I just look at the return, and it doesn't seem like much, especially when you know there were some reports about what they were looking to get back for Okafor. And they, uh, you know, they, they were looking at, you know, initially multiple draft picks, including, you know, at least one first rounder, young players. Like there was, you know, really good things out there that they were apparently talking about. I do think the DeMarcus Cousin trade or trade kind of uh, hurt the Sixers, the uh, Brooklyn Nets, all these teams that were kind of looking to move a big man. Um, suddenly their asking price had to go way down because, teams were saying, okay, well, the best center in the NBA just got traded for this and kind of comparing it. So that I think that definitely hurt them. But um, I probably would have held on to Noel. I I think uh, either trade him sooner, trade him over the offseason, trade him last year. I think you have to make that decision about, you know, not signing him maybe sooner. Um, Try to move him at a different point if you can. If not, I probably would have held on to him and not lose the asset for as much as they did. What do you know about Justin Anderson, a guy that was worth taking a flyer on for a player like Noel? Well, I mean, I think the pick is where I'm lost. I mean, I, I like Anderson because I think he's a really he has a great work ethic. He is um, he, he has potential to be a very good two way player, um, very athletic. I like his game a lot. I think you know you're going to be able to find young players back in the deal for Noel, but the thing that I don't understand is the pick protection. Zach Lowe actually reported on it and said that. Um, if the pick falls out of the top 18, then it turns into two second rounders. 
Now, I don't see a scenario where Dallas finishes, you know, inside the top 18. Uh, so it seems like this is going to be two second rounders for Noel, and that's really unfortunate for the Sixers. Um, Okafor, they end up keeping. Is it they don't find a deal? Um, something, you know, nobody was interested. How does a guy who gets sat because it looked like he was getting traded end up not going anywhere? Yeah, I was I was shocked, to be honest. Um, I had talked to a few different executives, and uh, three different GMs, actually, had told me that they believed Okafor was going to be traded, that there was no scenario he'd be on the Sixers past Thursday. So that was the mindset of GMs. And, you know, I hear that, and uh, on one hand, uh, you know, I, I think that that kind of shows maybe why he didn't get traded. <laughs> and every single GM in the NBA, NBA or a lot of them, are, are sitting there and saying, okay, he's definitely getting moved. Then you have zero leverage in a trade. So maybe the Sixers are talking to teams and they were thinking, okay, they're going to just take the best, best offer and they're not going to, you know, keep him. And maybe that's why, you know, ultimately they didn't, they didn't like any of the offers on the table because they, teams, you know, felt they had no leverage and felt they were going to move him. By keeping him now, you hope the, over the offseason, you know, you can, you know, I guess maybe shop him again and hope that offers improve and uh, maybe you have more leverage. I think that's the goal there because if you traded away Noel and Okafor and the return on both of those players wasn't very good, then, you know, we're going from talking about his trade deadline as being, you know, pretty bad to very, very bad. So I think that's the difference. Um, hopefully you can, you know, see Okafor and uh, Embiid together and play them a little bit, and I think that helps their leverage a bit in some of these conversations. Alex, I always hear that it's a point guard driven league and Brett Brown said that he thinks he's gone through 67 players and 18 point guards in his time here, which leads then to the question of when does this process turn complete? Yeah, that's a great question. I think uh, this is the draft really to target point guards. Um, you know, I know that Sixers fans probably don't want to hear that. They probably want to you know, hear about a free agent or a trade or someone like that that you could bring in. But I do think that, uh, this is a very strong draft class when it comes to point guards. So, you know, it's always good to have that option. In recent years, there hadn't been many, you know, uh, top point guards found through the draft. I think if you look at the last uh, five years, the 15 point guards taken, um, you know, really high. Outside of Damian Lillard, it's a lot of guys that still have question marks around them. Guys like Alfred Payton, guys like Dante Exum, you know, if you look at over the last you know five years. So, I think this could be one of the best uh, draft classes when it comes to point guards in quite a while. Um, but, you know, they, they could look at free agency or look at, um, you know, a trade in the offseason. That's very possible, too, because, um, you know, they do have assets. Uh, and I think now with Embiid and, you know, Ben Simmons coming back next season, you're going to be able to kind of pitch things differently to free agents. I think there's been more excitement in Philly and more momentum, um, at least this year than, you know, in years past. So hopefully they have a better a shot at uh, free agents as well. Yeah, uh, Colangelo today, I mean, obviously they announced Simmons out. I don't, is there a big surprise or not really? No, I don't think so. I mean, I had, I had thought he would play. Uh, I think I told you that, that I was thinking he would play. But I think it makes sense now. You know, you just traded away. No one's the well. You're not sure when Embiid's going to get back because he's going to miss four the next five games. Um, you're really far out of the playoff picture at this point. You know, even – you're really low in Eastern Conference. So if there is any questions about Simmons and his recovery, it's just safer to be cautious. Um, you know, they're in a situation where these final 26 games, and Bede's going to miss the next four. We don't know if he's even going to return or not. We know Simmons is now out. Um, would you characterize the season for the Sixers a success? I think I, think I would, just because, you know, they – they improved their win to- their win total, and then there were some things that were out of their control, I think. You know, if Embiid stays healthy, then I think they have an even better record. Maybe we see Simmons play. Um, I think I think uh, it, it is a success. I, I wouldn't say it's, you know, a resounding success because they didn't make the playoffs and they didn't take that huge step forward, but there was progress. You know, I think it was good for the fans to, have, to see what Embiid can do and see, okay, he could be, you know, a real deal guy that is a centerpiece of this organization. Um, I think it was... You know, good for um, the team to start kind of down the process of clearing up that log jam. Um, especially, you know, like you said, they if, if they felt like Noel was going to be back, then getting something back for him is very good and not losing as a free agent because you never want to lose your assets for nothing. So while I was critical of that deal, I understand it. 
Um, I think it was, it was a success, uh, but hopefully they can take that next step forward next year. And, uh, you know, this is a, a stepping stone for them, and they don't take a step uh, backward next year. Let's expand on that, Alex. So in your mind, are the Sixers a playoff team next season? Yeah, I think so. I think with Simmons on the floor um, and the, his ability to be able to, um, you know, run the pick and roll and five guys for easy baskets, basically my goal this offseason, if I'm the Sixers, would be, First of all, making sure Embiid and Simmons are healthy. You know, you don't want to push them or have them, you know, do things like play summer league or, you know, have crazy off-season workouts. Um, you want to make sure they're healthy and make sure they're, uh, you know, doing some things that are preventative, too, from an injury standpoint. Uh, a lot of these different gyms now do stuff with these guys. You know, they look at their body movements and their body strength in different areas and uh, do, a lot, do a lot of preventative things. So I'd be focused on that and then try to find shooters to surround Ben Simmons with and then try to find your point guard of the future. Um, but I think that we've seen Embiid is good enough to be able to make this team very scary. Put Simmons next to him. Put some additions next to him. I think this is the playoff team. Uh, Sports Bash 97.3 ESPN. Alex Kennedy, NBA on Twitter. Check out that article on how trades go down in the NBA at hoopshype.com. And you can get that uh, on his Twitter account, Alex Kennedy NBA, as he joins us on Fridays to take a look at the association, which returns to Philadelphia tonight when the Sixers take on the Wizards. You can hear that game on 97.3 ESPN. Have a good weekend, pal. Thanks a lot.